Shalom, damn it! This is Rabbi Saul Solomon of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And you know, I have had for many, many years a body by Jake. Not the uh, Jake Trainer on the TV, but the body was, which is basically a post-World War II, post-Holocaust Jewish body, which means I'm short, I'm kind of funny looking, I'm balding, but I do all right. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the kind of Jake that I am talking about with us on the telephone here this morning on Dave's Gone By. I'm so excited to talk to this man who created an off-Broadway show. It's called... Uh, uh, where, where the hell are my notes? God damn it. I, I have the Torah open and then I lost my notes. It's a Jew grows in Brooklyn. It played five years ago off Broadway. People loved it. They ran to it. They brought, they brought their grandchildren. They brought their dead ancestors to see this show because it is so funny and smart and beautiful about the Jewish experience in America, in the new world, as it were. So wonderful that he ended up bringing it to all these different places, uh, Miami, Toronto, Maryland, Chicago, even Phoenix, where, well, I guess there's Jews in Phoenix, but Jewish, Gentile, doesn't matter. You're going to love A Jew Grows in Brooklyn, and he has brought it back off-Broadway in an open run at the Jacqueline Onassis Theater. Very exciting, and we are very excited to be talking with on the telephone, Jake Ehrenreich. Jake, can you hear me? Rabbi Saul, I can hear you. Vismach Bayid, how are you? Oh, Vismach Stu, I'm good, but I hear, unfortunately, that you are not so good this morning. What's the matter? I'm a little under the weather, you know, but uh, these things happen and we, we move on. Are you having chicken <laughs> soup? I'm trying, yeah, I'm having my wife make it right now. Oh, oh, good. Force your wife to make it for you. It's always better when you force someone to do it for you rather than having you do it yourself. Well, it's always better. Listen, if you know my cooking, it's always better if anybody else makes anything that I'm going to eat. This is true. This is very true. So, so, and you also, <clears throat> you have a performance today, don't you? I do. We have a performance this evening, yes. Oh, good. So you're not doing one on Shabbos. You're doing your way we, You know, we, we actually normally do. i got to tell you, Rabbi, you know, it's, but we have a dispensa special dispensation because of the, the content of the show. They allow us, because it's a joyful thing, to, to do it on Shabbos. So we usually do, but this afternoon we, we don't. We're just beginning this week, and uh, there was a little scheduling thing with the theater, so the first week we don't have a, a Saturday afternoon performance. Okay, that was more information than any of us needed, but thank I you. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what made you think, you know, uh, judging by your uh, your familial upbringing and your your grandparents and all that and your parents, what at what point came to you and said, you know, there's a one man show in this? You know, I I, so I got to tell you, I really did. I, you know, I can answer you in a few different ways, but the truth is, I, you know, I was walking and and I was thinking, what am I going to do with my life? I was success, a successful musician and and an entertainer and an actor. And I really wanted to make a difference, and I, I decided I would tell the story of my family. You know, I'm an American. I grew up here. My parents are Holocaust survivors. My sisters were, were born in Europe as well. And, I, you know, I wanted to tell the story of an American immigrant kid from the perspective of the child, and I wanted to tell my specific story in as uplifting a way as possible um, because, you know, it's been a, a very challenging time. I mean, I, I grew up in Brooklyn. You know, I, I wanted to be an American kid. I really was. You know, I grew up in a tough neighborhood in Brooklyn. I mean, my neighborhood was so tough, mother was half a word. <laughs> but I grew up as a First, child. By the way, excuse me. I, I just wanted to be Mickey Mantle, you know. I, I don't, and, hold uh, on, hold on. I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. you, you did not even allow me the chance to say how tough was it. Shame on you. <laughs> You're a comedian. You should know better than that. Let's do that joke again. And this time, do I, you it know, I grew up in a tough neighborhood in Brooklyn. How tough was it? It was so tough, mother was half a word. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Much better. You Continue. Know, I, I, I'm used to not having anybody talk to me, so I just go, go well, through it. Oh, myself. you're married. I get it. Okay. So, yes. I, I, that's right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually married 15 years. Mazel. Seems like 15 minutes underwater. Oh, you're only saying that because she's feeding you at the moment. I know, it, I know. Let me tell you, could you imagine I'm married 15 years, we still have sex almost every day? Do you really? Almost on Monday, almost on <laughs> Tuesday. Almost. Funny. You know, you're bringing me to the Catskills. I was always afraid to get married because I always heard that marriage was like a hurricane. Is it? In the beginning, there's a lot of blowing and sucking noises. At the end, you lose your house. 
<laughs> you know, all right. So you bring me back to, to actually, you bring me back to an important place. You know, in the summer times, we used to go to a place called the Catskill Mountains. You know, of we course. called it the Borscht Belt. Right. And people know, you know, the Catskills were, was a place of great humor and, and entertainment. But the truth is, for families like mine, it was very, very important place because this is where we would go with big groups of Holocaust survivors, and, and our families were almost normal. You know, this was a place where we sort of learned to laugh again. I, I, we're actually doing a documentary for PBS on, on a serious note. Um, sure. I interviewed a fellow who has essentially the same life as I do, you know, his parents are survivors. He put it very succinctly. He said, Jake, I would listen to my father cry through the locked bathroom door in Brooklyn every night, and in the summer, I would watch him laugh every night to these comedians in the nightclub. You know, so for us, the Catskills was actually a very, very important place, and we we had fun. So that, but those are the jokes. Obviously, you're, you're bringing back, me back no, to that, my youth. That's, that's wonderful. As, as a youth. matter of fact, um, do you happen? Uh, this is totally off, off, not off the topic, but uh, when. We sent out the email saying that you would be on the show. Some relatives of the host of this program, Dave, uh, said, oh, 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 do you know uh, the Rosemarins up in, in oh, upstate, my. New, upstate New York? Is that true? The, well, of yeah, course the cousins I know the Rosemarin. Of, of Dave, you know, there was Rivian and Jerry Rosemarin. They ran the bungalow colonies up in, uh, where, in Monroe. In Monroe. Listen, that's where I live. My son now goes to day camp at Rosemary's Day Camp in the summer. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. No, they're, they're very dear friends of ours. Well, see see what a small now? world the it is. son runs it. Scott and Stacey. Scott runs it. And, and you know, the, the parents, it, it, Belle is, was my father's, like, girlfriend. You know, not really. But Marty and Belle are dear friends of ours. And so is Scott. I mean, the whole mishpucha. It's right down the road. Of course I know Rosemary's Bungalow Colony. What That's can I so tell you? funny. I've got to send this to them. It is a small... Well, the Nazis make it a whole lot smaller for us. That's what happens. So, so yeah. let me ask, if you don't mind uh, saying what your parents' Holocaust experience was. What happened to them? Sure. Yeah. You know, um, so interestingly enough, when I grew up, and this is not unusual for survivor families, my mother would, would always want to talk about her family. And, um, and my father never spoke about his experience at all until much later. And then he really saw it as his obligation to speak about his experience. But in a way, we were really the, the lucky ones. You know, by a quirk of fate, my parents ended up spending the war years in work camps in Siberia, deep, deep inside Russia. This is actually where my sister Wanda was born. Oh, wow. And then later, my sister Joni was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany. So while we lost, you know, almost all of our relatives, all of my aunts and uncles and, and grandparents and cousins, my parents survived because they were they were actually. I, this may be more information than you no, listeners no, need to know. But when when Poland was divided by Germany and 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 Russia, there was a place in the middle called the Pass, which is a demilitarized zone. And my parents were there. Um, at the time that Germany attacked Russia. And, and at that time, everybody ran. You know, the, the, my parents, the displaced persons, they ran with the Russian army. And then they were in Russia, and they were sent to Siberia. And, and they ended up spending the war in work camps. Um, and that saved their life, ultimately. It's funny. Com comparatively, compared to Bergen-Belsen, a work camp in Siberia is, a, is, is like the Ritz Hotel. Absolutely. No question about it. I was made to understand that. You know, when I when I my mother would tell me the stories, I mean, she would talk about her family, and I, you know, there there are stories that I do tell in the show. I mean, I got to be honest, the show is a comedy, and there's a lot of music and a lot of joyful, you know, a lot of comedy, but the serious moments of the show are quite serious. We um, there's a, a video on stage, there's a large screen. You know, the the, the set itself is is the front of my house in Brooklyn, and the, there's a, a music musicians, a band on the different levels of the porch, and then where the garage would be, there's a large screen. And on that screen, we show a lot of photographs, but we also show part of my father's testimony for Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation. And, you know, this is, a, I mean, that's, those are the parts of the show that are very serious. And my journey here was to tell what is essentially a serious story in as joyful a way as possible. So I, I tell a lot of jokes, and there's a lot of funny stuff, but my intention is that a serious story gets told, but it gets told in a way almost like, um, you know, a, a little sugar with your medicine, you know, makes the medicine go down easier. And, um, yeah. and, and it's been very, I've been very fortunate because um, not only have Jews come to the show, a lot of non-Jews too, 
and and the comments I get from them are amazing because you know they see the story in a different kind of way and it's a hard story to hear I mean you know let's face it even when I'm flipping through the channels most of the time if I see something about the Holocaust I'll flip by it because unless you're really going to get into it I mean it's hard you know so um, I've chosen a little different path here I'm very respectful um, I certainly, you know, you know if people like Rabbi Marvin Heyer, you know, the head of the Wiesenthal Center, and, and Alan Dershowitz and Michael Berenbaum, these guys are not going to put up with nonsense about the Holocaust. They've all come, and they all really, you know, speak very highly of the show. So I, I'm very respectful of the, of the topic, yeah. but I try to couch it in terms, you know, in other terms that make people, um, you know, relaxed and, and having a good time, and then they could accept that information, I think, easier. Because I have to say, I, I did my one-man show, Shalom Dammit, an evening with Rabbi Sal <laughs> Shalom Dammit. <laughs> Shalom Dammit, yes. It, we did it in New York uh, at the Richmond Shepherd Theater just a couple of weeks ago. We're hoping to bring it back in August. And uh, people, Jews, they would come up, even non-Jews would come up to me after the, the show, and they'd say, you know, Hitler had a point about you people. And I, and I felt I was doing uh, the Lord's work there. I don't know. It gets a bigger laugh in the show. I don't let that really well, die. No. Right <laughs> I got to tell you, you cut out there for a minute. It was probably oh. a good joke, but I missed part of what you said. So. Oh, so we, now we, we're even, because I screwed up one of your jokes, and you screwed up one of mine. <laughs> good. We're fingered. We're fantastic. We're excellent there. All right. Let, let me ask. Did you have the usual... Um, American Jewish experience of this kind of, you're raised in the Jewish culture, you got the Holocaust parents, you got, I'm sure, Jewish Hebrew school and all of that. Did you reject it for a while and come back to it? Or did you never go through that, that youth, teen, twenties thing of saying, oh, I've had enough, I just want to be totally assimilated? Oh, yeah, are you kidding? That was my, my whole life was, you know, until much, 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 much later, I was totally assimilated. I mean, first of all, I called myself Jack. Because, you know, I, my name growing up was Yankee. So, you know, really? I'd be playing on a block. We, we'd all get called in for dinner. It would be Gary, Mark, Stephen, Yankee. You know, that was like the worst for me. So I became totally assimilated. I was a... Uh, you were a New York Yankee. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Continue. <laughs> That's right. And I, I um, you know, I became a rock and roll musician. I mean, I, I, I toured and I played with Richie Havens and Greg Allman. I, I, when Peter Chris left um, KISS... I was one of three drummers left auditioning with them, you know, so I got to know them. Actually, two of them are children of Holocaust survivors, believe it or not. Listen, they're nice um, Jewish boys. Well, not so nice, but they're Jewish boys. Oh, yeah, no question. So, no. anyway, wait, did you, but you, you, I guess you didn't make it past the final audition, but or did you ever play with them? Did you ever. Absolutely. Did, you played I with I was kids? in a room, a, you know, a 12 by 12 room with me and Ace and, 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 and you know, Gene, and, and I, it was just, the, the, you know, the four of us. And um, not only did I play, but I got to the point where I sang Black Diamond, and, you know, I mean, I was there. You know, there were like three guys left. Oh, um, well. So, no, I was, look, I was originally a musician, and I was an accomplished player. I played five Broadway shows on drums and did lots of tours and lots of recordings, and, uh, you know, as a, as a singer as well. So I was, I was very, very assimilated. And really, the way that I got back in this thing was um, I was asked to be in a show called The Golden Land, and this is this like in the early 80s, I guess. Was it the um, public theater? Was it one of the PAP things? You know, I no, I did a show for, for Joe um, PAP called Jonah. That was a different show. That was Elizabeth Sweater show. This was a show that was like half in Yiddish, and, the, and they got me. I had hair down to my shoulders, and someone told them that, oh, there's this guy, he sings well and he speaks Yiddish. And um, my father said, you know, I, I, and I told my dad about it. He says, oh, you got to go in and audition. I said, Dad, this is like the last thing I want to do. But I went, he says, your mother's sick, you got to go. And, you know, and I'll tell you that story about my mom. But anyway, I went in, and um, lo and behold, I ended up doing this thing. And then I met all these kind of Yiddish-speaking young people. And I thought, you know, one day I'm going to actually tell this story. This was my parents' story that show was about. And I said, one day I'm going to tell the story from my perspective. I also did Beatlemania at about that time. And I thought, I'm going to use the multimedia stuff from Beatlemania, um, and I'm going to use the story of this, and, and I'm going to do this one of these days. And then about, you know, maybe 15 years later, I, I wrote this. And it's been going. I mean, you know, I just came back from L.A. and Palm Springs, and I have... You know, people like, you know, Adam Sandler and Shecky Green and then Billy Crystal, all these guys. I mean, it's, the show has gone nuts. 
And um, there's fantastic. a book now by the, the Chicken Soup for the Soul publishers, and there's this PBS documentary. I, I really am incredibly fortunate. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing that my wife said. You know, what, what you don't know is that part of this story is that my mom and both of my sisters developed early Alzheimer's disease. And my sister Joni passed away when she was 55, and Wanda is, is in a nursing home now. She's 67. And my mom was in a nursing home by the time she was in her early 60s. So it's really sort of a disastrous family. You know, the stress of what happened really, really sort of destroyed my family. But I have a beautiful wife and a beautiful son, and I'm, I'm very positive about life. And my wife said the most important thing you could do with your talent in this show is just to sort of give people a sense of that they can overcome their circumstances. And that's really the overall view of the show. It's, it's not supposed to be a Jewish show necessarily. It's supposed to be just a show, you know, about life and about how we can really focus on the positive in our lives, not in a, in a, in a simple way, but in a deep way. And that, and you could really guide your journey if you do that. And, and that's what I've tried to do. And, and I'm lucky because people get it. Well, can I ask you though, do, do you have a fear? That, what are you, 56 years old, 57? How old are you? Yeah, I'm 56 now, I think. You think <laughs> I never really know how old I am, but I think I have turned 56 in February. I'm either 55 or 56. Well, well, there you go. When you forget something like that, or if you can't think of somebody's name, do you get the little chill in your spine thinking, oh, oh, it's I, starting? You know, I can't tell you how many times. It's a good question, but I'm, I'm asked it often. And as a matter of fact, I've been contacted by several research organizations wanting to do some testing on me because it's so prevalent in my family. I will tell you this. My point of view about it is that, you know, we all have some genetic predisposition to some ailment. You know, some families have heart disease, some families has, have Alzheimer's, right? I'm convinced that the, the remedy for this is to, to live as joyfully as possible, to be as positive as possible, and that will affect your constitution and, and really ameliorate the, the effects of whatever your genetic predisposition is. I feel strongly about that, and when I get stressed out about something, I sort of remember, you know, that if I'm not careful, you know, for the grace of God, that there go I. You know, so that's the way I choose to deal with it. There is no treatment, you know. Right. Um, and so far, I could still remember what I'm saying. So let's, you know, <laughs> I'm looking forward to a, a long and, and fruitful life. And doing the show is also a very good thing to boost your memory, to keep the, the neurons and the synapses going and all that, I think. It's, it's forcing I you think to... so. And I try, you know, I try very, very hard not to make the show a script because it's a very, very personal show. And there are there are certain parts in the show where people yell out to me, you know, and and I converse with them, and we have these kinds of uh, you know little little sessions, and uh, it helps me because it helps me to stay in the moment, you know, and make sure that I'm really present because I've done the show thousands of times, you know, I, I upgrade it, I change things um, depending on the audience, and some of the greatest things have been, you know. With, with audience members. I mean, the things people say I, are really, you know, funnier than anything <laughs> I could say. Well, can you, do you remember any particular funny or interesting or wild anecdotes that you've heard from audience members either sure, during the show sure, or I after? Sure, sure, I do. Yeah, I do. We have me. a place in the show where I can announce, you know, I do a recreation of a Catskill Mountains nightclub. And as the MC, I announce birthdays, you know, I do all this kind of stuff. And we let people email in, and along with the fictitious funny birthdays that I'm mentioning, I could mention a real birthday. So we got this email, this woman is 92 years old, and I mentioned her name, and I said, oh, blah, blah. and you know what, I just usually mention, her, mention the person's name, and then I move on. Meanwhile, I mentioned her name, she gets up, she says, oh, wait a minute, that's me, that's me. And she starts going into a whole thing. And, you know, people are hysterical because she's really, she's really with it and really like, you know, like a politician. She's really going for it. So I said, sweetheart, you've got to be kidding. You're 92 years old? So tell me, please, tell us all, what is the secret? She says, the secret is the three Ps. I said, all right, now I see. She's got like a whole routine, this chick. I said, okay, I'll bite. What are the three Ps? She says, no pets, no plants. No penises. So everybody cracks up, right? And, and she's really serious. I said, so wh what is this? My wife um, asks her later, after, at the end of the show, my wife happened to be there. And this was the worst part of it. 
she goes up there. She says, let me ask you a question. Why no plants? <laughs> so my wife gets it. Like, no penises is real. Is, of course. Is, you're right. You know, reasonable, right? But I asked the lady. I said, why? Why those three things? She says, I don't want to have anything that I have to take care of. Oh. It's great. I mean, people, and she was dead serious, man. It was very funny. Um, and we have a lot of stuff like that. I have a, a thing that that a guy yelled out that I now keep in the show. I just tell people about it. So on the screen, um, there's a period where I put up an old business card of my father's uh, store in Brooklyn. He had a, a furniture store, the Gem Upholstery uh, the Furniture Center, right? And a guy yells out out of the audience right when this comes up. He says, wait a minute, that's your father? I knew your father. Oh, we bought a beautiful sofa at the store. So I said, you're kidding. What a coincidence. You still have the sofa? He says, no, no, but I don't have that wife anymore either, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. And then I tell you, you know what I say now? It's funny because I thought in my mind, why doesn't this man have his sofa? You know, did this guy not put plastic slip covers <laughs> on his furniture? <laughs> and we all laughed. You know, so a lot of things about the, uh, the, the audience make, make me laugh and it keeps me on my toes. I have a great audience always. That's, that's that's terrific. It's wonderful. We just have another uh, moment or two with Jake Aaron Reich. And I, uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much. I can hear you powering uh, past your your illness, your cold. <laughs> thank you. But, yeah, it's, but, my voice is a little. You can hear. I'm a little shot. Abyssal, a bit, and you do have to do a show later than this. Uh, you know, tonight. And, I do. But you are in an open run at the Jackie Onassis Theater in New yes, York. Yes, the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Theater, right in the heart of Broadway, 120 West 46th Street. Unbelievable, right? Exactly. Between 6th and 7th. I mean, the corner is the TKTS booth. And it's great. It was, you know, the last time we were there, we were at the Lambs Theater on West 44th Street, which was also great. They tore that down, so now we found another place to be. McMuzzle. And you're there, is it eight shows a week, a normal playing thing? We're there seven shows a week. Um, I do I, I do Wednesday through Sunday. I don't do Tuesday. I get two days off, you know, to, to be with my my son, my fourteen year old son now, and, and my wife. So that's cool. And I can I don't know. I guess I should give you the the numbers. Yeah, with, um, to buy tickets, of course. Yeah. All right. It's eight six six eight one one four one one one. Say it again. Um, or, or they could go, uh, you know, a JewGrowsInBrooklyn dot com, and you could buy tickets through there. Eight six six eight one one four one 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 for tickets to a Jew grows in Brooklyn, or you can go to JewGrowsInBrooklyn dot com for tickets and more information about Jake Aaron Reich. And uh, let, let me ask one of the uh, over the past few weeks, we've been talking to a lot of uh, solo people and monologue and off Broadway kind of people because I've been doing my show and I've become very interested in that mm. and. Some of these people, like the the accidental pervert guy, uh, also Jewish, of course, and uh, Steve Solomon, who's been doing his Jewish show, a lot of them, they end up becoming so successful that their show goes on with somebody else playing them. Has that happened to you yet? You know, interestingly enough, we've been asked this a number of times, and and the truth is that when my father got ill um, in New York, you know, I, I spoke to, to my producing partners, and I said, look, if my father's about to die, I'm, I'm not going on, so we better find somebody. And we did find somebody, and he went on about nine or ten times when my father was very ill. And then when my father passed, I just stopped doing the show. You know, right now, um, we've been asked to do this a number of times. We have not agreed yet. Uh, I know Steve does it. And, you know, uh, It's a very personal show. So I imagine eventually, you know, um, we have a, a few other things cooking, like I have a TV show that's going to start. So there may come a time when, when we want the show to be out there and I, I may not be available to do it. We'll think about if that's uh, appropriate. But, but so far we, we have decided sort of, you know, n- not to do that. So I don't know if we ever will. My wife is like dead set against it. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. You know, we may have to rewrite it if uh, a bit. If we do that, but and it's, it's besides Canada, personal. besides Canada, have you done this show in other countries? No, we stayed in North America. I mean, this winter we did Palm Springs and, and Los Angeles for the second time, and then we did. You know, we do big theaters. We we were in uh, Sarasota and Tampa and two thousand seat theaters. We went back to Fort Lauderdale at the Parker Playhouse, and we've been all over North America. We were in Toronto with the Mervish Company, who they're the biggest producers yeah. in Toronto at the Panasonic Theater. That was great. 
And it's, um, you know, we've been so busy in North America that we haven't traveled abroad, but we've been asked to go to Israel and Australia and South Africa. And, you know, I, for me to go with my family, I would really just go with my family. So we have to figure out a time when my son isn't in school and all that. This is like, a, you know, it's a, it's like a family uh, <laughs> kind of I understand. Um, I, your I project you. almost now. And there are so many other things going on here. We have a screenplay that went to Billy Crystal and Adam Sandler. So, you know, it's hard to, to leave town. I guess we would go to Israel um, because that would be a great family trip. So we're thinking about doing that maybe for three weeks um, next year, take a little break in New York. But we'll probably be running in New York for, for years. God so willing. That's the, that's the idea. So, you're, now, well, so. you're not in, living in California. Family is in New York with you, or do you fly at the end of the week to be with your family in California? No, you know, we did not. We were going to move to California because um, we had been asked. There's a, a few um, television and film things going. But my son is entering high school next year, so we had to make a decision. We were either going to all move out there um, and sort of uproot him and, and make a, a new life, or we would just stay here. And we decided ultimately um, just for him, you know, to, to stay here so he'll he'll go to high school, you know, locally. And so we reopened the show in New York as opposed to doing it in L.A. And I'll fly out there when, it, when I need to. So we stayed in New York. Um, we have a beautiful place in Monroe, New York, you know, right near Rosemary. Right. Um, so we made, we made the decision to sort of stay home at least for the next, um, I guess, his high school period, about, about four years, I guess. Wonderful, wonderful. We've been talking with Jake Aaron Reich. Very last question for him. He is the, uh, the cast and the writer of A Jew Grows in Brooklyn, playing at the Jacqueline Kennedy on SS Theater on 120 West 46th Street. Last question to let, Now, let me, let me interrupt for a minute, because oh, sure. I don't want to get myself in trouble. So there are three other people on stage with me. Oh, um, it's not me. like a Steve yeah. show. There's, there's a live band, and they, they sing, and they play, and they're on stage with me. So uh, sometimes people do refer to it as a one-man show, and, and, you know, I do most of the talking, but I don't want to downplay their, their role. They're very important, and they're excellent and very, very talented musicians and singers. So are, are they I want to give them their due. Are they Jewish? Uh, you know, some are and some aren't. And we've had, you know, all, all, we've always had you know, multiracial bands and all, all stuff going on. We have just the best musicians we could get. Um, so, yeah, they don't have to be Jewish. And you don't even have to be Jewish to, to come to the show. You don't. You don't. It helps, but you don't have to. So, you know, interestingly it, enough, yeah. I, and I, I feel very gratified about this, reviewers go out of their way, like the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times and Broadway, where all these reviewers went out of their way to say, look, you know what, aside from the name of the show, you really don't have to be Jewish um, to see it. And, and I take great pride in that because the original title of the show was not A Jew Grows in Brooklyn. The original title of the show was Growing Up in America because it was not supposed to be a Jewish show. Although the story is very Jewish, but it's, I, I look at it as a more universal story about life. But we were cautioned when we started in New York the first time. A very smart producer friend of mine said, look, you know what? You don't have like $10 million to, to, to throw into advertising. You better pick some group somewhere that's going to come to the show and then spread the word. Otherwise, you know, growing up in America, I mean, you're down the, down the block from Jersey Boys. You know, you're never going to survive. So we changed it, you know, and, and it worked out well. So, um, you know, I'm pleased, but... But it, you know, it's supposed to be a pretty generic show, even though the story is very specific. I get, no, I totally get it. It's like Fiddler on the Roof for Presbyterians. It works. You know what? Interestingly enough, okay, I'll buy that. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough, what? No, that right. That, I mean, that's a, a, an interesting comparison because um, Fiddler on the Roof. You couldn't be a more Jewish show than Fiddler on the Roof, but the themes in the show are a universal theme of family and 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 culture. So in that way, yeah, I think that that's, that's probably right. So would you say that it is harder now or easier or a mix being Jewish in America in 2012 than it was when you were growing up in the 60s and then 1970s? Well, you know, that is actually um, quite a, a, an intelligent question. <laughs> I, don't I know, I don't know how it came out of me. me. But, no, the reason is because on a certain level, I think um, it's easier basically because multiculturalism is more um, accepted. You know, in, in those days, it really was be American, be American. Now, I think um, 
the immigrant experience being multicultural is is sort of hip, you know, and it's it's cool, and it's okay to have a different kind of name and all of that. On the other hand, I don't think that there is an easy answer at any time in in the world um, to say is it easy to be a Jew. It's certainly easier right now in the United States to be a Jew than it was in the United States or anywhere else in the world. On the other hand, you know, you got to sort of keep the pulse on on you know on what's happening in the world and things are certainly changing in Europe and 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 elsewhere and um you know it's like a tinderbox i mean i could i feel it maybe i'm more sensitive to it because of my family's history um but but it you know it's it's a good time and also a a you know a a time to be cautious i think well we are being we are not being cautious at all in thanking with open arms and gratitude jake Ehrenreich for being in the neighborhood, for talking to us, for telling us about his life, his family, and his show. A Jew grows in Brooklyn at the Onassis Theater on West 46th Street in Manhattan, 866-811-4111, or a Jew grows in Brooklyn. Dot com. Is it dot .com or dot .org again? Yeah, it's dot .com. Dot com. Oh, you even got the dot .com. That's thinking like a Jewish person right there. <laughs> Smart. Grab the com. Anyway, thank you. Have a wonderful show. Feel better. And Thank much you, Rabbi success. Sal. You know, we say in the old country, not what that is? I'm from the old country, Zeigezint, so Zayn mit Mazel. To you. You know what that means? Like, be well, and it should be with luck. I, I bounce that back on you double. Double, Thank double, you. double. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Sal.